fire. Hey, what's up guys, Floats on Hockey here, and for those of you who don't know, my name is Austin Brown, and outside of creating videos for this YouTube channel, I serve as an environment artist. So as an environment artist, I make 3D models for both video games and films. I currently have a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Interactive Design and Game Development, with a double minor in Visual Effects and Art History. My goal in this video series is to share all the knowledge that I've learned in digital programs over the past 9 years with all of you viewers. I want to inspire and educate all of you to pursue your passion for video games and all forms of digital art for that matter so that you can one day get your dream job. This video series will help you become a better artist and learn all that you can about the 3D modeling program known as Autodesk Maya. This first video will go over each section of Maya's interface and give you a brief explanation on how each of them work. The time code for each of these sections will be listed in the video description below, so feel free to revisit certain topics that we've covered in this video at any point in time. We'll start modeling in this program beginning in the next video, however we need to start by covering the basic functions of Maya's interface first. So without further ado, let's get started. Okay, so let's start out by opening up Maya. Immediately you'll notice that I'm working in Maya 2018, and if you don't have this version of Maya, let's just say you have 2017 or older, then that's totally okay. You don't have to have any of the newer versions to make this work for the series. It's just understanding the program and how it works in general. All the layouts stay the same. The only thing that usually changes is the color scheme and the symbols indicated with the icons for the functions that you'll be using. So for the most part, you'll be perfectly fine if you have the most recent older versions. But if you have something like 2009, it might be outdated for the series. So regardless of that, we're going to jump to our first section, and that is what we call menus. Menus are displayed along the top side of this program, and it's all these options along the top. So the seven main menu options that will stay no matter what will be all the way from File on the far left to Windows. These are our seven main options right in between here, and everything from the right and onward will be changed depending on our menu set. So right to the bottom left of that is what we call our menu set. If you click on the drop down menu, you'll see that we have modeling, rigging, animation, effects, rendering, and then you can customize your menu set. If I change from modeling to Asian, for example, watch what happens to my menu along the top. It actually changes with different options that I can work with. So if I want to animate an object, maybe I'll work in the animation menu set. If I want to model something first, I'll work in the model menu set so that I can actually use these options to help me create my model. Now, for the remainder of the series, stick in the model set. We'll work with that in the future. Alongside that, you'll see what we call the status line. The status line affects all kinds of options such as creating a new scene for your environment, creating a new project for your whole project folder, you can save it, you can back up a command or go forward, it's kind of like Word document whether you mess something up, you can control Z it. You even have grid options. So let's just say I have geometry in my scene, like this cube for example, and I move it side to side, and we'll get through all this in a future video. But basically, if I enable grid snap along the top in the status line, you'll notice that it starts snapping to each unit in Maya's workspace. So the grid is identifying the units and what they look like. And there's a set size that you can always change to a bigger size or a smaller size. But by default, this is what it's going to snap to. Now, we also have rendering. So rendering are these options right here. Let's just say I want to render that cube. I took an instant photo of my uh, object and I can actually see what it looks like. So if you make a really cool figure or an environment of some sort, you can take a photo of it and share it with your friends. So it's really cool. Next to that, we have our user account menu. So you'll notice that this is my account linked up right here. You can manage your license. You can use a one month trial of Maya. You can uh, download it with a student license, or you can just buy it for 185 a month. It's very pricey, it'll go down in the future, but this is where you have your license agreement. So beneath all that, you'll see this giant row of orange symbols and then green ones on the end. This is called our shelf. So this giant row for our shelf is a giant list of hotkeys. So for example, if I was going to uh, add another object to my scene, I can go to my shelf with poly modeling and then add another object instantly. And so that way I can edit two objects at the same time. And you can do things like that. You can even edit these objects with commands in the center part of this shelf. Now you'll notice it's just like a menu set in a sense that 
there are different options. So in the menu set, we had modeling, rigging, and all this other stuff. In the shelf, if we're not modeling and we're going to animate, let's just say this cube, for example, to go from this spot and fly all the way over here. We're going to want to control that action in the animation shelf, which is right here hidden in these tabs. And you can go from shelf to shelf, kind of messing around and see what you need to work with. But for this video series, again, stick in modeling. So poly modeling for the shelf and then modeling for the uh, menu set. Now off to the top right hand corner, you'll see workspace. By default, we are in Maya Classic. Maya Classic has an asterisk right next to it to indicate this is the default uh, workspace that we're going to be working in. So if anything is wrong in your scene and something's messed up and you're not seeing the menus that I'm displaying to you, always just go to the drop down menu in your workspace selector and then hit reset current workspace. And when you do this, you'll notice it just resets your workspace. It doesn't get rid of anything in your scene. That will remain the same. But if anything's messed up outside of that, it'll just reset it and display options that were once collapsed or deleted in the past. So it's a really useful tool up here. And to the right of that, we actually have our sidebar icons. So we're only going to be focusing on three of them uh, for the time being. And you'll notice that whenever I have one of these tabs open, like the attribute editor, for example, it will indicate what's opened in these sidebar icons. So I can click it again to collapse it or click it and click it. And you'll notice that all my sidebar options are gone. So to open those back up, I just click on the options that I'm interested in, which are those three, the attribute editor, the modeling toolkit, and the channel box slash layer editor. So starting out with the channel box slash layer editor, if I have an object in my environment and I move it around, you'll notice that I have three different options I can do with it. I can move it, I can scale it, and I can rotate it. So moving, scaling, and rotating are called transform options. So all the transform options for any object that you create will be seen in their attributes in the uh, channel box and layer editor. So you'll see up here on the top right, whenever I move an object, it will affect the translate uh, properties. Whenever I rotate it, it's going to affect the rotate properties. Whenever I scale it, it's going to affect the scale properties. And that's how you know where you need to position it in space to align it up in your scene properly. Now, associated with that, we do have the layer editor in the bottom right hand corner in this sidebar tab. And the layer editor basically says that if we have a new layer that we created, we can associate an object to it. And by doing that, we can make it disappear uh, because it's connected to that layer. So this layer is now connected to this object, which we'll go over in the future again. I'm just doing it really quick for quick coverage. But basically, we can associate layers to objects and groups of objects to either hide them or display them so that we can have an easier workspace. It'll make it a lot cleaner to actually work with. So outside of that, we have our modeling toolkit. And this basically allows us uh, to edit our, obje our objects. So it's just like a shelf up here. When the shelf has these icons in here, these are all the same over here. So if I want to uh, cut this object in half with the multi-cut tool, I also have the multi-cut tool up here. You know, So I can actually work with either my shelf or the sidebar for the modeling toolkit. Either one is a preference. They both are the same thing. Next off, we have our attribute editor. This affects the color of your object and the transparency of it. So for starters, with transparency, it's basically the opacity of something, whether you can have a solid version of it or see straight through it or kind of through it. It's basically however you want to control that. So now that we've gone through the three main sidebars we're going to be working with, you can honestly collapse them if you need to. And by collapsing them, you can just click on them on the side if they're active and just push them off to the side. So let's just say I have modeling toolkit out and that's eating up too much space. And I, I don't like that there. It's too, it's too hectic on visuals. I can just click it again and it will collapse itself. If you want to expand something, just click on it again and then put it back in. So that's a way to kind of keep your workspace clean so that you can work effectively in your environment and not have so much clutter on your screen. Now, on the top part right here, right beneath our shelf, we will find our panel toolbar. Now, just like our attribute editor, you can actually change the shading, lighting, and views of your object. So for example, we were changing the opacity of this object just a moment ago. If I come over here to my panel uh, toolbar, I can change it to wireframe mode. So I can see straight through my object, but see just the outer rim of the geometry that creates it. So that's really important 
so that you can work efficiently in your work environment. You can also change it back to shaded. So different shading modes are associated here. If we have light in our scene, you can turn on light. Currently it turns black because we don't have any light, no worries. You can add a camera to your scene. You can uh, do render options. You can change the color of it. You do all kinds of crazy stuff with this, which again, we will go over in a future video. So to the left of our uh, panel toolbar, we have what we call the toolbox. It's just these tools right here. So say I don't have an object in my scene and I go to my shelf and I add a cube, a polygon cube. I'm going to click on it and I'm going to choose from my toolbox uh, a transform option to help me edit this. So it's too small right now. So I'm going to go down to my last option, which is scaling, left click in the center and then drag it up. So that way I have a bigger cube to work with. If I want to rotate this cube, I'm going to click on the rotate option and then click left click and drag and you'll see we can rotate the cube. If I want to move it from side to side, I'll choose my move option and then I'll move it. There are hotkeys for this. The hotkeys are as follow. Uh, w is for moving, so you can move it. E is for rotate. And then R is for scaling. So you can utilize those and it will kind of uh, pinwheel through the functions as you hit the hotkeys. The top one is just select, which is Q. You can click off an object and you can just select it easily. It doesn't have any other function outside of that. Now beneath that, we have our quick layout buttons. That's from this horizontal line and down. So basically we're working in uh, the view panel of perspective. So perspective is indicated right here. Perspective means we can go in 3D space and look at our object from any side or angle or do whatever we want to it. However, if we want to change that, we could just hit the hotkey of spacebar, which will put us in the four panel view, or we could click over here and then click on the four panel view. So basically we have our perspective uh, view panel right here and the other three panels display completely different viewports so this displays top so this is a top down static camera view of our object and these static camera views of front uh, top and side and other static camera views are known as orthographic views so you'll either have perspective view where we can edit in 3d space or you'll have orthographic which is just moving around at one static camera angle and you can only edit the object from that one point. So for example with this top down view I can't move any other angles but you'll notice if I move it in this space it's going to change in all uh, camera viewports as well. So no, no, no matter how you edit it it's going to change depending on the location you're working in. So always be aware of that and utilize these to the best of your ability. If you ever need to change uh, a viewport let's just say we hover our mouse over the bottom left panel and hit spacebar it will put us into that tab. Let's just say we don't want the front view. If I hold down spacebar and left click on Maya and hold, I have other options I can put it in. So let's just say I want two perspective views. I can choose perspective. So when I hit spacebar one more time, I'll have two perspective views to work with. Kind of unnecessary, but you get the gist. You can control whatever angles you want. Orthographic views have a heavily gridded background, so you'll know you can only move in one space and you can't do anything else. Perspective, you can move in 3D space. So that's how you know the difference between the two modes. Now, you can always go back to perspective view. You can go to split panel view, which is just two, which is really nice. Or you can just go to our outliner. So outliner is basically saying it has a list of all the objects in your environment. So if I have cube one over here and I hit control D and I duplicate it and I just move it over, I have two cubes. So cube one and cube two. I can select these cubes in my outliner and I can even rename them if I want. So I can name it to uh, awesome cube two or something like that. So whenever I go to search for an object really quickly, I don't have to go through a thousand objects just to find what I want to edit. I can just go to my outliner, search for it, find it, delete it, edit it, do whatever you want to it. So that's a quick way to utilize your outliner. If you want to collapse this menu, just click on outliner one more time. So. We're in our last section down here at the bottom of our screen. So we're not going to be working in this too much, but I thought I'd go over it anyway, just so you guys can get an understanding of it. So basically, this is our time slider. It indicates how many frames we have to work with if we're making an animated film. So if we have this object over here, and we're going to make it go from the left side to the right side of our screen, we would have a timeline that plays it as if we're editing a film. So our playback controls are over here at the bottom right, 
If I hit play, you'll notice it continuously loops that playment of our animation. We currently don't have one, so it's not playing anything, but that's what it would do. It would just loop through it. Beneath that is our playback options. So if I didn't want it to loop, I would hit this button here, and then it would just play a single time, so a single animation. If I wanted to, if I wanted to play it back and forth, I can click it one more time, and it'll play back and forth. So that's just one example of how you can edit your options. You can even control how many frames you have per second. So since it's by default at 24 frames per second, let's say you want 60 frames or higher per second. You can go down here, add 60 frames a second, and look how many frames we have now. If you wanted more frames to work with, because you're making an animation that's longer than, let's just say, 5 seconds, you can come down here, type in, instead of 500 frames, maybe you want 1,500 frames. And that way, you'll have 1,500 frames to make an animation within. And it'll be really fun to edit with. You can also, beneath our time slider up here, go to our range slider. This basically zooms in and out on your time slider. And the point for this function is so that if you're editing a film with lots of keyframes, you can actually zoom in really close and edit those frame keyframes in detail. And then you can zoom out really far if you want to have more broad animation and not really detailed in it. So that's how you would utilize that. This other menu right here, this is our animation slash character menu and basically you can add a character to animate into your environment through this setting or you can add uh, pre-made animations however we're not going to be working with that in our video series so no need to worry about that to the bottom left we're also not going to be working in coding but this is how you add mail scripting and python into your environment maybe even c++ but i don't code so who knows um, basically you can open up your script editor down here and you can add code to your environment mail scripting or python and that is used with the command line as well. And our final one is our helpline. So if an object is imported into our scene or you're messing around with it and it corrupts somehow, so it messes up in a way, you have to see what the error is in this line right here. It'll tell you like, hey, this is wrong. And it'll tell you how to fix it. So if it says this object it has too many polygons, which are the faces right here, then you have to decrease the amount of polygons on that object and make it work. Okay, so I think I've covered just about everything I wanted to cover with the interface. If you guys still have any questions about it, please let me know in the comment section below and I'll make sure to get back to you as soon as I can. I hope you guys are enjoying the series so far. Again, we're going to get into the modeling aspect as soon as we start our second video for this series. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you all for watching. Don't forget to rate, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.